Hello and welcome everybody to the very last session in this room. Testing and remote access to embedded systems, DPI and LVDS display output by Marek. Please take it away. Oh, thank you. Hello everyone, welcome. Um, I hope you are enjoying Prague. Um, my name is Marek Vashud and this talk is going to be about testing and making um, DPI and LVDS displays available remotely. Um, I divided the, um, the talk into five or six sections. Uh, first of all, I'll talk about the motivation, why I actually even had to build my own hardware for this stuff and what were the processes behind this. Um, then I'll explain to you hopefully uh, that the behavior of the hardware, so you have some sort of an idea what it is that we'll be capturing with this custom hardware. Um, after that, I'll talk about two approaches which I took during the process of the development of the hardware because um, this slide deck is actually a combination of two slide decks. Um, two or three weeks ago, I discarded the entire slide deck as I found out something new and something which made it all useful. Um, and I booked it all as a failed approach and now I have another approach at the end which is so much better and so much simpler and so much nicer. So I'll talk about both. Uh, finally, I'll talk about how you can build your own hardware um, because what I'm going to talk about here, this is something which you can build at home and you actually don't even have to solder if you really want to do it on the cheap, but if you want to build your own PCB, I'll show you how to do that as well. Um, I'll prim primarily talk about DPI, but then at the end I'll talk about LVDS as a little bit too, and then we'll wrap it all up. Uh, quickly about me, I work mostly on the U-boot bootloader Linux kernel. Every once in a while I send some odd patch to the open and beat it, but uh, the part I'll talk about here is the FPGA hobbyist part, because this is what I do for fun. Um, so that's about me, but uh, let's get to the motivation part of this talk. Um, so this all actually started with um, a some vendor. They had this development kit and um, I was testing software on it and they had like a bajillion of displays modules attached to it. And I, every time I had to test the software, I had to test all the display modules. And I was thinking like, eh, this is not really good. I have to keep unplugging the modules, replugging them and it sucks. So, um, I decided that it would be probably a good idea to build some sort of a device which would allow me to not do it and just maybe capture the stream from the display directly so I can just verify that what is coming out of the board is actually the expected signal and I wouldn't have to plug and unplug this, these displays all the time. Um, then a colleague of mine, when I told him this, he said like, yeah, if you can actually capture everything then we can also use it in CI because if you have like the, the whole thing from the display, the whole waveform, the entire frame, then you can store it in memory and then analyze it in the CI and then validate between different software update versions that the stuff that is coming out of the device is uh, still the same. Because it could happen sometimes that uh, software update will slightly change the timing of the display interface and the display vendors, they are very sensitive to it. So if you are operating their displays uh, out of specification, then they may not accept the warranty returns if your devices start failing. So if you can do this in CI, then you can validate it that your display is still operating within specification. And then um, slightly after that, a colleague of mine, he's located in Brazil, um, he's been bringing up some sort of a display and the display has been in Germany. So I was like, yeah, okay. So you have this webcam hanging above the display and it's not really optimal, this mode of operation, right? And it kind of clicked in my head at that point that if we had a device which would again be able to grab the display interface directly and stream it out somehow, um, then there would be no problem, there would be no webcam, there would be no distortion of the image which is captured by the webcam and it would be all super nice. That is why I decided to um, build me hardware 
And now I was also exploring the potential software options. What could I do? How to avoid really building any hardware? Um, so one of the options which came to my mind was, okay, we can start grabbing uh, frame buffers directly from the memory of the embedded device and then stream it on the network one way or the other. Either FBDF or uh, DRM subsystem, or we can use uh, Veston with RDP backend and just payload it into the network and send it out. The problem with all of this is that um, FBDF is obsolete. Uh, DRM subsystem does not necessarily guarantee you that you will have the full frame buffer in memory. Uh, there can be like a damage on top of it. Um, not everyone is running Veston with RDP backend. And what all this has in common is also that um, you need to modify the software on the device. And this may not be welcome. Uh, besides, all that this, all the information this would give you is um, that the buffer in memory has been rendered correctly. You would have no idea what is coming out of the device. That means from the point where the CRTC, the scan out engine, picked up the buffer from memory, as it is passing through the display pipeline until the display connector and the display itself, you would have no information what's going on in there. Um, this can be solved partly by using uh, functional safety functionality of some of these bridges and CRTCs, uh, because some of these devices allow you, as a frame is scanned out through them, to calculate the CRC of the frame and return you the CRC. Um, this is a functional safety feature. Not all the CRTCs support it, not all the bridges support it, but the DRM subsystem does have support for that, and the Intel IGT tools uh, do make use of this for CI testing. But then again, you do not get frame out of it and um, you cannot stream anything out uh, on the network. And again, it's not really useful. So I decided to build my own hardware basically to grab the interface itself as it is coming out of the board or the embedded device. Um, now, there are three different types of buses which you will find in embedded devices when it comes to display output. I'm not going to talk about the pluggable ones. That means no HDMI, no DisplayPort, no VGA, no nothing. I'll talk about the ones which are directly soldered on board or somehow attached through a, some sort of an FFC connector. The oldest one is the DPI interface. A uh, lot of you probably know it under the moniker of RGB. It's, uh, the name is, stands for Display Parallel Interface. It's literally the oldest one. It works in such a way that the embedded device generates clock. Um, on each edge of the clock, this device generates uh, pixel information. Uh, this is clocked out on data lines, which there is one all the way to 24 or maybe even more. And then there are uh, three synchronization signals, horizontal, vertical, and display enable. Um, the signaling is usually 3.3 volt, LVTTL. Uh, but people are getting really creative in what they put on the pixel data lines. Um, we'll talk about the very standard variant of this. Um, the other interface, which is really common in newer systems, is called FPD. Uh, it stands for flat panel display link. And very often it is um, called LVDS. Uh, the reason for this is that this interface does use um, LVDS signaling on its differential and clock pairs, uh, but the encoding on those differential clock pairs and differential data pairs is uh, called FPD. Um, this interface uses one differential clock pair and three or four differential data pairs, unless it's a dual link LVDS. I'll talk about that later. Uh, it's basically a serialization of the DPI interface. So it's possible to change problem. I want to capture FPD into a problem. I want to capture DPI. And I'll show you how. Um, the latest, greatest interface is a MEPI DSI interface. It's a standard by the MEPI consortium. Um, it is quite different from the other in two interfaces. Uh, it is packet-based. It still uses uh, differential pairs, so one clock, one or more data, at least in the DeFi implementation. And um, it uses 
in the DeFi implementation yet again uh, to different voltage levels on those diff on those pairs. And I'll not talk about this, but uh, maybe there will be a follow-up talk on how to investigate DSI. Um, first of all, I'll talk about the DPI bus because really this is the simplest one. You basically get a clock out of the embedded device uh, and per clock you get pixel data and then horizontal vertical synchronization. Um, now, if you have an embedded device and it has a display, what you see on the display is the picture, but what is on the bus actually is not just the picture, there is more. Um, the picture which you see on the display itself is just this, the active area. Um, but in order for the display controller, the chip which is on the back side of the, of the display, which is called TICON, timing controller, um, to do its own internal um, management operations, there has to be what's called margins. This is the stuff around the active area. So when a frame is clocked out on a DPI bus, what happens is actually we start here on the, in the top left corner. And at that point, both the horizontal and synchronization signals are asserted. Um, for a few clock, the horizontal synchronization signal is kept asserted. Then the horizontal synchronization signal does get de-asserted. Um, at that point, we enter the horizontal back porch. After that, we enter what's uh, called still dark pixels. Um, but uh, if this was an active line, we would be uh, clocking out uh, active pixel data. Um, so there is a line of dark pixels, which is as wide as your display image. After that, we enter a horizontal front porch at this point. And this repeats for the entire duration of the vertical synchronization active pools, which is here. Um, after that, there is a vertical back porch, and this is again a couple of lines. And only once we get out of the vertical back porch, we have a first line here where the horizontal sync is asserted, then it is de-asserted, we are in the horizontal back porch, and then there is a first line of active pixel data, that's what you actually see on the display, uh, clocked out on the DPI interface, and after that, there is a horizontal front porch again, um, and this repeats for all the lines which you actually see on the display. Once all the active lines with actual valid pixel data are clocked out, there is vertical, um, front porch, and that's when all of this is clocked out, that's when the frame actually ends. Um, so it's not just like the active pixel data. Now, if we want to do um, capture of this kind of an interface with these kinds of timings, we need to decide what it is that we want to capture. We have two options, basically. Uh, one of them, we want to capture just the picture, which is on the display, but that's kind of useless because we cannot then analyze the display timing and tell whether, okay, maybe there is some sort of a timing problem. So we probably want to capture the whole thing. And so this is what I decided to do, capture literally everything. Um, and I was also thinking, okay, um, I don't want to capture just the pixel data, but I also want to capture state of some of the control signals. That means the horizontal sync, vertical sync, uh, potentially even PVM. And this actually works very conveniently because if I have RGBX pixel format, I can store the pixel data into the RGB bytes and I can store the state of the auxiliary signals like H-Sync, V-Sync, data enable, PVM potentially in the bits of the last byte in the RGBX um, pixel. And this way I will have the state of these signals per pixel clock included in the data which I capture. Um, now, what I had to do is some sort of a calculation of how much data I will actually be getting out of such a capture. Um, and I had a look into the Linux kernel, into the panel simple, and looked at the highest resolution DPI display I could find that was 1024 by 600 at 24 bits per pixel. So, okay. Um, and obviously this, this panel refresh is 60 FPS. So that, was, that is what we have to calculate with. But um, we also have to factor in the margins 
And if we factor in the margins, what we are getting is not 1024 by 600, but 1344 by 635. So that's the resolution of the frame. We have to multiply it by 60 and we have to multiply it by four uh, because 60 FPS and four bytes per pixel. And if we do that, we get the, um, the amount of data which we will be getting every second is 204 megabytes. So 204 megabytes per second. But that number grows uh, very quickly. If we pick a full HD display, 1920 by 1080 plus margins, it's roughly 500 megabytes per second, which we will have to capture. So we need some sort of a high speed interface and we have basically two options, Ethernet, Gigabit, not an option because that caps at 125 megabytes per second of the raw line bandwidth. It's just very far from 500. Um, any sort of binding of Ethernet interfaces or 10G Ethernet is not an option because uh, you don't have it on your laptop. It's just not ubiquitous, so it makes it hard to use and also doing 10G Ethernet in FPGA just isn't super easy. But there is another interface on your laptops, which has been there for a while, which is USB. And actually USB 3 conveniently gives you um, line bandwidth of 625 megabytes per second, five gigabits per second divided by eight. Um, of course, the protocol overhead will be there, so it will again be less than the 625, but um, it is way above the 500, which is fantastic for us. And the bonus is that there exists FIFO chips, which can accept external data and turn them into USB 3 packets and they handle all the USB communication for you. So all you have to do is use one of these chips, um, feed data into it, capture them on the other side on your PC, one way or the other, and then somehow turn them into an image, right? Um, I found two of these chips, which are USB 3 capable. One of them is from FTDI. And this is actually an entire series of chips. So they either make 32-bit FIFO to USB 3.0, or they even make a chip which behaves like a UVC webcam. Um, UVC stands for USB video class, um, which is basically what all modern webcams implement. And it sounds fantastic, right? So if I could just turn the DPI image, which I get, into a webcam kind of like looking stream, then it would be super compatible with all the uh, existing operating systems right away. And well, that's not true. And I'll explain why shortly. Um, the FTDI device is also good in that it doesn't need any firmware. It just needs to be configured one way or the other with some sort of an either EEPROM programming or some sort of an FTDI tool, and then you can use it. The downside is the FTDI device generates clock. So either 66 megahertz or 100 megahertz on its parallel interface and its clock output. The DPI itself is also clock output. So there has to be some sort of a glue logic in between those two devices to kind of do the adaptation. Um, the other device I found is from Cypress. It's called an FX3. Um, this one is far more flexible. It has 32 bit CPU in it, RMB5, which is like ancient, but okay. Uh, it has a DMA, it has a flexible 32-bit interface again um, on one side, it has USB on the other. Um, but the thing is, um, the 32-bit interface can also be programmed uh, to receive clock. So it doesn't only generate clock, it can just receive clock as well. That's cool. It is also some sort of a state machine which can be programmed with their tool, um, but I'm not using that much. Um, they even have a UVC demo, which runs on the RMV5 core, which is also nice, but, oh yeah, and one thing which is also nice is there is documentation for this chip and it's complete. And it's, it's like a really decent data sheet. Everything is documented in there. It is well documented, cool. But now the downsides. So downside one, their SDK doesn't run on Linux fully. The configuration of the interface, the 32-bit interface just is not capable of running on Linux in this day and age. Hmm. Um, the other downside is that their SDK contains blobs, so it's not fully open and the license is kind of dubious. So 
uh, it's unfortunate. Um, but let's take a look at the possibilities and then maybe how this could be solved. Um, I took two possibilities or two approaches to this. The first one I decided to do is like go for maximum compatibility because the UVC looked super appealing. Basically, if I could build a device which you plug into any OS, any computer, and it will just be able to capture the DPI interface, it would be fantastic, right? Um, and both of these chips could do that, which is very nice. Um, but this failed spectacularly, so I decided to go for the simpler approach, just um, use the DPI, feed it into the bridge chip, and then directly do the um, capture on the computer, and then the soft processing of the data which I get out of the bridge chip on the computer and display it somehow. And this worked really well and it also removed the necessity for extra glue logic in the end. Okay, so the failed approach looked like this. I basically had the device under test. This was the DPI source. Uh, then I had to have glue logic FPGA there, then the bridge chip, which I used the FX3, and then I streamed the data over the USB C uh, over the USB 3 into a PC. Um, one of the problems was the USB video class because it doesn't provide enough flexibility for me. Um, the other problem was that um, the bridge chip here expects a parallel camera sensor in the UEC example, and it's also a little bit problematic. Um, let's talk about the UVC. So UVC is a USB video class. It's a standard by USB Implementers Forum, um, and the standard defines um, the following, basically. Um, it says that there are some pixel formats which are supported, and sadly, 32-bit RGBX pixel format is not one of them, as far as I can tell. Um, but there are non-standard extensions defined by various OS vendors, which are documented at some random websites poorly. Uh, one of them is RGBX8888, or 32-bit RGBX. Uh, so I implemented this extension, I now had to patch the Linux kernel. Okay, patch is upstream, it's part of Linux stable, backwards as well, so you probably have it on your PC now. Uh, but that's already a problem with the UVC, that you have to patch the kernel. At least, I had to. Uh, the other thing is, when you plug in your webcam uh, into a, any PC and the UVC kicks in, it reads the USB descriptors and figures out the resolution which the webcam provides. And this is done once when you plug the device in, basically when it's enumerated. Uh, it, the UVC doesn't support dynamic resolutions. So the problem I ran into was that um, sometimes I wanted to receive lines which were of varying length and if the UVC video driver in the kernel detects something like this, like a frame which is just short, a few bytes or something, it will drop the frame. Oops. Apparently, other OSs do this as well. Uh, luckily, the Linux kernel has a module parameter for the UVC video, which is called no drop. Um, so that way, I can at least receive a frame, which is short, and get it into Linux user space. But then, Linux user space tools like GStreamer and FFmpeg will do the same check. They will see whether the frame might be just short, and then they will discard it. So I had to patch also GStreamer and FFmpeg, and ultimately the benefit of using the UVC is just gone. Now, um, the other problem is, um, these UVC uh, chips and the firmware expect parallel camera sensor. This works differently than uh, DPI display output. Uh, the parallel camera sensor has also two sync signals, line valid, frame valid, but they indicate when um, valid pixel data are produced by the sensor. Uh, this stuff around the valid pixel data, here it is these margins, this is called dark pixels, and at that point, the sync signals from this uh, sensor are, are not active. Now, um, here is a better infographic. Uh, basically, what we have to do at that point is uh, we need some sort of an adaptation layer, which would, in the FPGA, turn the DPI input synchronization signals into something which looks like CPI synchronization signals for the bridge chip. So there has to be an FPGA glue logic, there is no way around it. And 
luckily for us, uh, what we want to capture is everything that means um, that we can basically confuse the, um, the UVC bridge in such a way that we say, okay, we support fixed resolution and we report it to the computer and then we implement something which is called an asynchronous FIFO. Um, now, asynchronous FIFO is a um, device which allows you to transfer a lot of data from one clock domain into another clock domain in an FPGA. This is often what is used. Um, the idea is, at least in this case, that um, the DPI would be the slower clock domain. We would pull in into the async FIFO as much data as possible. And on the other side of the async FIFO, what we would do is we would detect um, horizontal synchronization pools within the data. When we detect this, uh, then we would wait until the FIFO fills up with roughly one and something lines of the DPI data. Um, and then we would start draining the FIFO when it reaches some sort of a fill level. Uh, we would drain as many data from the FIFO as um, the end of another horizontal synchronization pools. This way, we would be able to pull basically one full line of DPI data out of the FIFO. And if that was short uh, compared to what we configured into the bridge chip and what we reported to the um, Linux kernel, uh, in the UVC descriptors, then we would just be sending blank pixels. This way, we can always send a full line of data as the UVC video driver would expect. Um, the other problem is we also need to send the correct number of lines, and this is increasingly then, yes, problematic. We basically have to do line counting, and we have to use a trick where um, when we send some amount of lines, then we basically just start generating fake pulses to confuse the state machine in the FPGA FIFO um, uh, correction in the uh, in the bridge chip that it would think that we actually send it the whole full frame already. The state machine in it is kind of simplistic, so that can be done, but it again is another complication. Um, by the way, uh, I tried this on an FPGA on Cyclone 4E uh, with timing constraints and all in place. I could get the async FIFO output frequency to 65 megahertz, which is just not enough for, uh, especially for um, the 100 megahertz capability input of the FX3. So I decided, okay, the UVC is not worth it. It's just not flexible enough. Um, the firmware patching of the FX3 and of their UVC example also problematic. And then I need this DPI to CPI FPGA logic, which is also not great. So I decided to go about this differently and really simplify this. Um, I took the display output from my embedded device and connected it directly to the bridge chip and then the bridge chip to the PC. Uh, the idea is that I will basically start capturing the DPI interface as the clock come in into the bridge chip and I'll just get the raw pixel stream. I'll get the pixel stream on a PC in a buffer and then I'll somehow process it and do something about it. Uh, the only problem that was remaining at this point, because I can do the software processing, that's not a problem. You just get a stream of data, it's a, no problem. Uh, the only problem here was that um, the vendor tooling for the FX3, right? And this is actually where my previous slide deck ended. Um, then I was discussing something on the Sigrog channel. Now, Sigrog is an open source uh, logic analyzer, measurement equipment, control suite, and so on. Um, there are multiple projects associated with Sigrog, like Pools View, like um, the FX2 LAFV. You should definitely look into it if you're in uh, the electronics stuff and you are interested in open electronics control tooling. Um, now the FX2 LAFV is an open firmware for the predecessor chip to the FX3, the FX2, and it makes the FX2 basically behave like a logic analyzer. So it allows the FX2 to oversample its input bus at clock generated by the FX2 
and stream each of the samples over USB into Sigrog. Sigrog has support for this. So this way you can build on the cheap logic analyzer. Now I was thinking, yeah, if only there was firmware like that, um, but for the Cypress FX3, that would be fantastic, right? Turns out there actually is one written by this person, Markus Komstadt, um, and the suggestion was actually given to me completely um, out of band by someone who comes uh, on the channel under the nickname Tank. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that suggestion. Thank you very much. Um, and they basically said, yeah, I'm using the FX3 as a logic analyzer and it kind of works. And it didn't click in my head immediately, but then after a few days I was like, hmm, is this fully open? It actually is. Wow. So then I realized, hmm, all we would actually have to do is take this and flip the clock direction, which should be easy. And since there is even Sigrog integration for the FX3 LAFV already, it's like a few patches, I could use that. So I rebased those patches, I tried the FX3 LAFV and it worked. I had the high speed, actually super speed logic analyzer out of this. Cool. So what is left? All I had to do was flip the clock direction in the FX3 LAFV since this is fully open, no blobs, no vendor stuff, and no proprietary goo. I could easily do that, um, but then all that is left I, was to use Sigrog, capture data somehow, and then visualize them, and then potentially remove the dependency on these tools because I didn't want to have too heavy dependencies, right? Um, so I patched the FX3 LAFV. It was super easy because the documentation for the FX3 chip has been available. So I just flipped two bits. Um, I didn't find out that uh, one has to also disable DLL when the clock input is activated. So I did. Uh, the FX3 LAFV, just like the FX2 LAFV, even has a control endpoint to it. So you can configure it this way from your host PC. I added configuration for pixel clock polarity at the same time. And I now have a um, patched firmware, which can capture on input clock. Cool. Uh, you can download it here. There is a link in the slides, so just grab the slides, look at the links. This is how you compile it. You can just look it up later. Um, now the next step was to use Sigrog to actually capture the data from the FX3 LAFV. And Sigrog supports this, but I was thinking, yeah, okay, I have to capture my data into a file. And then I asked on the channel and Gerhard was like, sure, look at the continuous switch, which basically makes Sigrog just continuous capture data into something, possibly file in different formats. Um, and Sigrog also supports uh, soft triggers, which uh, you can see the entire incantation here at the bottom. Uh, the soft triggers allows me to um, wait for the vSync signal. When it toggles, that's basically the cue that this is the start of next frame, and the Sigrog will automatically align the start of capture to that start of next frame. So now I'm getting frames into a file. So what's the next step? Well. Maybe I don't want to capture these frames into a file, but rather uh, the idea is, can I put these frames into a named pipe? That means a FIFO. And it turns out this also works. So um, if I put a GStreamer as a consumer, GStreamer file source as a consumer at the other end of the named pipe and have GStreamer stream data into it, that just works. I'm getting frames in the GStreamer and I have the DPI captured there. Um, and this is the GStreamer pipeline that I used. I actually had to specify the explicit width and height uh, and other caps of the pipeline uh, so that GStreamer would correctly interpret the data it's getting from the FIFO, but I just got the, the GStreamer sync window and the video data looked okay. So cool. Um, then I decided to write my own tooling because I didn't want to depend on Sigrog, which has its own set of dependencies. And I didn't really want to depend on GStreamer immediately, but it seems like it, it's a good dependency. Um, so I've wrote my, my own tool, which just opens the USB device, sends the FX3 
LAFV a command start streaming and then reads out uh, bulk data from the USB. And this tool allows you to do three different outputs. Either um, it writes it into a FIFO, this, this data which it captures from the USB interface, or it can display them in an X window, which is kind of the easy way to see what's on your display, or it can feed them into a GStreamer pipeline, which also allows you then to do FPS counting overlay, and it also allows you to do sync signal visualization. So, demo, actually. This is how it looks like in the tool. This is Linux kernel booting on some sort of a machine. Um, as you can see, there is a little bit of a gap here. This is the, these are the margins. This is the blanking area. The actual active area is here. Um, I can do FPS overlay. Cool. I can do sync signal visualization here. Uh, you see no sync signals because this particular display has horizontal and vertical sync of one pixel. But you will see it later. Um, I have a capture from different display. And I can also do FPS uh, display sync using GStreamer running in on this embedded device. I can just display it in Weston. And then I can have another FPS overlay, which is on the host PC. So yeah, we can do this. Cool. Um, one thing which you have to be careful about is when the embedded system reboots, it will stop generating pixel clock. Uh, the FX3 is little sensitive to it, but uh, there are two ways to deal with this. One of them, you just disable interrupts completely on the FX3, and then the FX3 just recovers when there are new uh, pixel clock when the embedded system is done rebooting. That's the easy way. It also has a functionality which allows you to detect clock loss, which is super cool. It, the FX3 generates internally an interrupt which says, oh, there are no more pixel clock. Do something about it. Um, I used the simpler option, just disabled all the interrupts and let the FX3 recover on its own. Now, let's talk about hardware. So how did I build this? Well, actually, I bought a um, development kit from Cypress with this chip. It has... Uh, at the bottom, 2x20 uh, pin headers or plug headers. And there is two of them spaced 41.5 millimeters apart. And you can plug into them these, these kinds of easy to obtain cables. And with that, if, if you can just hand wire it with these uh, easy to obtain plug cables to your embedded device, this will actually work. And I got it to 70 megahertz pixel clock this way. It's, it's not how it's supposed to be, but okay, it worked. So essentially you need a development kit, you need a few cables and you are good to start with this. Um, but then I decided to do a little bit more permanent solution. So I designed my own PCB in, in KiCad. And now it's going to be a lot more pictures. So this is the uh, schematic which I used in KiCad. As you can see, here is the board connector of the development kit which I used. Here is the two 2x20 two connectors of the FX3 development kit. The rest is just wires. Um, I used the KiCad PCB designer and had it manufactured this PCB in some sort of a PCB house, then I populated it with just connectors. And this is the, actually the end result. So this is the FX3 development kit. This is my embedded hardware, which I wanted to test. And the PCB is actually underneath this, so you cannot see it, but hey. You saw the captures from this a little bit before that. Um, now, what I still want to talk about is LVDS bus. Um, so the deal with LVDS is that it's basically a serialization of DPI. It uses one clock lane, differential, and three to four data lanes, also differential, um, low voltage differential signaling. But the point is with LVDS, you can deserialize it into DPI and then capture the DPI. So you basically turn LVDS problem, which you have into a DPI problem, which you just solved. Easy. Um, this is how the pixel formats on the LVDS look like. There are only three, so that makes it, again, easier. This is all you have to deal with. And um, the chips, which you have to use for this, they are available from multiple vendors, um, from 
TI, from onsemi, from Tyne. Here are some types which you can take a look at. Uh, the only problem with this is that uh, you have to be careful about routing the differential pairs for the LVDS. You have to add termination just before the chip. There is like 100 ohm termination resistors in front of the, each uh, differential pair of the deserializer. And soldering the TSSOP56 packages is a little, takes a practice. Um, but then you can probably have your PCB house just manufacture the board for you and populate it for you, so it's just fine. Um, one extra detail about LVDS is that there exists something which is called dual link LVDS. So LVDS, the single link one, usually caps at like 1280 by 800 displays. Vendors obviously wanted to pump uh, full HD through it, so the idea was that, okay, let's duplicate the LVDS bus completely, and so they now have two clock lanes and eight data lanes, and they just send um, two pixels per clock cycle of the bus, one odd pixel, one even pixel. Um, to capture this stuff, I guess the best approach would be to capture this just like single link LVDS, and just get two buffers, one with odd pixels, one with even pixels, and then just merge them on the PC using same instructions, and that will be that. So, demo of the LVDS to DPI capture. Here, as you can see, more margins here, because the display actually has a lot of uh, sync signals there. Again, DP, um, FPS um, overlay works. Here you can actually see the synchronization signals. So the purple stuff here, that's the horizontal sync asserted. The blue stuff on top, that's the V-sync asserted. The gray stuff here, that's H-sync and V-sync asserted. So that's the sync signal visualization. Ah, Linux is still booting, cool. Um, here is an interesting behavior. So, as you can see, there is this kind of a smear, which shouldn't be there, right? So, this is the controller actually keeping the data lines in the last state when the last pixel was clocked out, just before the controller entered um, the blanking period. That is why the pixels are just replicated all around the image here. I would have never noticed this if I was looking just at the display, right? But here I can see it, because I'm capturing the pixel data all the time. Cool, right? And now I built a schematic for this in KiCad again. The only thing which I had to do was design me a um, schematic symbol for the deserializer chip. Otherwise, um, yeah, in the, in the KiCad integrated uh, schematic symbol editor. Otherwise, I don't again design my PCB in KiCad. Um, this is the 3D visualization of the PCB. This is the actual PCB in reality as it was manufactured and populated. Uh, this has been hand soldered. So it's kind of, eh, not nice. And this is the end result. This is what you saw the captures from. This is the thing in operation. So again, the FX 3D F kit. The PCB is actually visible here, the, the one which I designed, and this is the development board which I'm using. So this is the LVDS capture going on right now there. Um, and so what are the next steps? Well, obviously, MIPDSI, right? Um, so what do we do about MIPDSI? MIPDSI is a little bit more difficult, and it will definitely need an FPGA. Um, since the MIPDSI DeFi is kind of ubiquitous, I started looking around and I found an app note from Intel which says basically, okay, if you have an FPGA which has suitable bank configuration, bank voltage configuration, then you can use a couple of resistors and connect the DSI DeFi to the FPGA and the FPGA would be able to receive the signals. Um, now, there has to be an IP in the FPGA which does byte lane synchronization, depacketization, and so on. And the upside is the open FPGA um, people already implemented this. There are actually two implementations of uh, CSI2 RX for the DeFi. And 
this is fine because CSI2 and DSI, DeFi, RX, at the point where the depaketization happens, is basically identical. So we can just pull that part from either of these CSI2 RXs and feed the packets into the FX3 and then do something on the on the computer again, maybe like analyze the packets or whatever. So there is that. Let's wrap it up. Um, what I wanted to say is hardware is just obtainable by the FX3 dev kit, build an adapter board for cheap. Um, software, you can download at the links uh, in the presentation. Uh, the build, you can do at home, trivially, sure. And with that, do you have any questions? Unfortunately, we don't have any time for questions. So if you have any questions for Marek, you can ask him right now because I don't think there's any further session after this one. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>